and I see this far too often, we all know it, like the people who will do so much work for such little money, it kind of hurts it for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're a new photographer or if you've been in the industry for a little while, find out the prices in that area and keep your prices very competitive, those numbers. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Photo Pros Weekly. I'm Brandon Heiss, and I'm here again with Olivia Tuttle. This week, we're going to dive in deep with Jonathan Thorpe. Now, Jonathan is a commercial photographer based out of the Washington, D.C. area. And along with being a Westcott Top Pro, he's also a Tamron Image Master. Jonathan, welcome to this week's Photo Pros Weekly. How are you doing? Good, man. How are you guys doing? This is, this is awesome. I really Good. appreciate it. We are doing well. We are... Uh, in the heart of summer here. And, Getting rid of uh, poison ivy. Olivia <laughs> decided to uh, rub herself with poison <laughs> ivy this week. So, um, oh no. <laughs> she's, you're, you're I'm hanging recovering. Though, right? Yeah. I'm All on right. medicine. Is it, now. is it hot there right now? No. no. It's actually very <laughs> yeah. cool. It's, we had it's like, like a little, yeah. yeah, we had a very cool, uh, fall like day yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Where, this has been so bizarre. Yeah. It's no. So bizarre. It'll heat up. It's 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 summer. So, um, yeah. Well, listen, Jonathan. Let's jump into it. Uh, for those people that don't know who you are, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us how you got started in photography and uh, some of the projects maybe you're doing more recently. Sure. Uh, as you guys said, my name is Jonathan Thorpe. I'm a commercial and I guess we'll throw a portrait photographer into that mix uh, in the Washington D.C. area. Uh, I've been shooting full time now for just shy of 14 years. Uh, before doing photography full time, photography and video full time, I was actually an eye doctor and I worked in that field for about a month before I quit to pursue, uh, photography as a full time, uh, career. And the way that the whole story came about was I got a, I got a camera as a graduation present, uh, from optometry school for my folks. And I immediately liked it. And like growing up, you know, with your friends, you take pictures. We like we make skate videos with, with each other. So I had a tiny, tiny bit of a background in in photography and video. But I got this camera, and I went to a, a hip hop show in Baltimore with it, and took some some photos of the artist performing. Went home that night, thought the photos looked fantastic. In reality, they're probably the worst photos you've ever seen. But I was so excited for them, you know. And I, uh, I found the artist on MySpace, which is going to give my age out to the crowd very quickly. And I said, hey, I was at your show last night. I really loved it. I took some photos of you. Here you go. And I sent him off the photos and didn't hear back from him. Didn't really expect to hear back from him, you know. Uh, and then roughly, I don't know, three weeks later, I got a, a package in the mail with a thank you note. And it was Double XL Magazine, which is a very big hip hop uh, publication. And all my photos were in there published and he had used those for an article that they were featuring him and it was four pages all full page of my pictures from that show that night and my name was was published so immediately i, I was i was published really early on about maybe a month and a half even to owning a camera and at this time i'd already joined a practice so the next day i walked in and quit i was done i was like okay i'm a i'm a professional photographer now like that's what i'm going to do with my life because i got published i i've made it um Obviously, that was probably not the, the, the most smart of, of ideas. Uh, I didn't book any work because I don't I wasn't I was I really wasn't a professional photographer. I didn't know what I was doing. But, you know, in my brain, I figured, you know, if I can get published once, I can I can get published again. Like there's a reason I got published. So I started scouring the Internet, trying to find some way to make a dollar with my camera. Uh, I was doing kids birthday parties for like eight or 10 hours for like 30 bucks just just to make oh, anything wow. just, that I sounds painful 30 dollars oh, and you could have brutal. been but you could have been making uh, a couple more dollars than that uh looking at people's eyes right <laughs> yeah like 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 38 you know yeah <laughs> yeah so right. well you you like, weren't an eye doctor for long was there something that you hated about it uh hated no <laughs> it wasn't what i thought it was going to be and you know it it I'll just, I'll be blunt about it. I think people get into those type of professions because they want to make a lot of money. That's a big part of it. And when I started looking at on paper, it was going to take a long time to get out of my loans and my debts and everything, just because it takes a long time to get a patient base. So I thought photography would get me there quicker. <laughs> <laughs> so, For $8 so an hour. <laughs> 30 bucks. 30 bucks you know? And I was so excited to get that $30. Like that was always, 
I felt better about that paycheck than I ever would have gotten at the office because it was like I made that for myself. I went out there and I hustled and I found work and I and I provided something to a client. Um, and it was a good feeling. And I loved that feeling so, so much. Um, so then I found another another gig on Craigslist that was for a lacrosse tournament, shooting photos of the players that you would then sell back to the parents of those players. And it was it was a big payday for me. It was a hundred bucks a day from from six AM to like nine PM. So really like was that math like four dollars an hour or something when it's all worked out but they gave you a camera they gave you everything so i show up to this event and i I'm just holding down the shutter button just spraying photos all day long just dumping cards throughout the day long story short uh one of those images actually got purchased by adidas uh for a billboard in every dick sporting goods for about a year wow. and that's what kind of led me to like the commercial photography world so i never had to go into like the wedding stuff I never did like a lot of events though. Like I said, I did the birthday parties or once in a while. Um, I was doing pet portraits, I think, for a minute. Um, but I was kind of just thrown into this commercial world uh, out of nowhere. And from there, it was it was Red Bull was the next client, and then I think H and M was after that. And it just started happening very very quickly, and I couldn't really stop it. Yeah. But you, uh, you saw cool. the potential with with commercial photography, <laughs> and and yeah. you know, as far as uh, a career. You know, uh, I, I think that probably would would open most people's eyes and say, oh, yeah. "Holy smokes, I can make a I can make a big living here." Absolutely, and I and I had no idea that photography was even a career that you could really have. Like, I grew up. My mother, my mother was a painter. My dad was a mechanic. We were pretty like blue collar and pretty, pretty, you know, whatever. And I knew that you could be a working artist, but in my brain, I never kind of put photography and art in the same category for some reason. I just, I couldn't get there. And when I realized like, oh, I could, I could do okay with this. Um, it was, it was a no brainer. Like I had to stay with it. And then, you know, just those feelings like I talked about with making my own money and, 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 you know, hustling and the work ethic that comes with it and the, the art of running a business, all those things kind of combined, it just, I, I never felt more, uh, validated mm -hmm. uh, than I ever did than with photography outside of optometry. It was just, it's a great feeling. Yeah, Even I would I would feel super motivated with those brands recognizing me that quickly. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it was scary. It was terrifying. Yeah. Because I really didn't know what I was doing. And I was teaching myself lighting um, on the side by, by using flashlights with G.I. Joes. I would hold flashlights around their heads and then make a note of that and then just be like, oh, that looked neat. I'm going to go do that with, with little speed lights that I bought off eBay or something like, <laughs> and like cheap trigger systems and everything. I was using Vivitar 285, uh, speed lights for far too long in my career and getting by with it. Cause you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, like being recognized by brands that early on and then having some kind of foresight to, to know that that was important that I was being recognized that way and that this wasn't normal. This wasn't the, the typical behavior of a working photographer. I think that says, you know, you have to kind of, it's, it's a cliche, but striking while the iron's hot. And I wanted this so, so, so bad. And I'm lucky that I've never had to do anything else since I got into photography. Like, you know, I said 14 years ago, um, I've been able to do this full time the entire time and not really put myself in any terrible situations. So it's, it's been, it's been awesome been a lot of fun i get to travel the world and do stuff like this this is great this is so fun all right jonathan i've got a question that i'm sure a lot of people are probably wondering uh you you mentioned you shot that lacrosse tournament you know that's kind of where you had your first let's call it a big break where where you know dick sporting goods you know picked up that image um and then shortly after or i don't know how long after was the red bull and and the other big high profile uh, clients, how, how did those uh, clients come about, and you know where did they find you, or were you out there just hustling and grinding? Yeah, so so the clients kind of came in pretty quick after that. Uh, Red Bull was, you know, after that deal was done with with Adidas, that was like a few weeks after that. And the Red Bull story is actually kind of funny. Um, I got hired to to shoot uh, the basketball tournament that Red Bull was sponsoring here in DC. And while I'm there, I'm shooting it. And one of the players, uh, his name was Andrew Washington, was just standing out amongst everyone else. Like he was just dominating the court, 
he had a lot of just attitude and charisma about him the whole nine. So after one of the games, I went up to Andrew. I was like, hey, man, I'm here shooting for Red Bull, whatever. But if you don't mind, would you mind sticking around after everyone leaves and just doing some portraits with me? Um, he was all like, yeah, that's awesome. That's no big deal. So, you know, he stuck around for like three hours while that, that court cleared out and just talked to me for a little while. And after he was done, I went to my car and I grabbed some flashes. I At this time, I think I was using like white lightning heads or something, some old stuff I had bought off of a, like a garage sale or whatever I found up. Pulled them all out and I took some portraits of him and I sent those. I sent the the game photos off to Red Bull. On accident, I sent those other portraits. Those are going to be my portfolio images I was going to use for something else or whatever. But those were in the link that I sent to Red Bull. Uh, when Red Bull saw those portraits, they're like, "Well, what's this all about?" I was like, "Oh, it's, it's this player Andrew, and uh, you know, he's he's he just stood out. Like, he, I just thought he was cool. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to send those. I know that wasn't the assignment, whatever." Uh, they're like, "Actually." Uh, there's a magazine, Bounce Magazine, which is a subsidiary to NBA Magazine. They need a cover for their next issue, and this would be perfect. Would you mind doing that? I'm like, yeah, sure. This is like the Adidas thing all over again. And I started realizing that, like, even though you're on a client shoot, it's also, if it's advantageous to everyone, you know, get your own stuff for your portfolio, too. Like, put in that extra, like, 10 minutes if you can. And get something for yourself you don't know where it's going to lead to and that led to the cover of this magazine so my first magazine cover uh and then h&m i don't recall how h&m popped up but that was just a out of the blue email so i was just in, in terms of how i was getting these clients you know i think it was just word of mouth like it was just like kind of once you get in at a certain thing like it starts to just snowball out of control and it this is all in the, the that same year within that year i was working with these clients and it was just which is out of control. Like it was, it was interesting. It was, I was doing the, the, a type of work that not a lot of people in my area were doing. It had a very produced look. Uh, it just looked very high end and it looked kind of polished. Even at, even early on, I was still using tons of light and like, it just that wasn't happening around here. And that people just took notice. And that got me through like my first few years is like booking clients that then knew somebody else and needed photo work and then kind of just word of mouth would spread from there. Do you think being a commercial photographer, a lot of the brands and industries, like they'll talk and want to share your name or is it sort of like hold on to this photographer themselves? It's a little bit of both. Uh, I think there is a huge benefit as a client. If you give another photographer to another client, as in like you kind of look like a hero in that person's eyes still. So there's probably a lot of that going on. Um, I, over that, that being said, I have had people say like, we don't want you to work with anyone else. We're not going to tell anyone that you shot this, stuff like that. Uh, so it kind of goes both ways. You know, bigger brands want the new kid. They want the new look and whatever. So they're all going to kind of come after you uh, no matter what. And that's just how it kind of goes. But I don't think anyone's like, like hoarding certain photographers. I don't think that's going on. It might be, but nothing I've ever seen really. Jonathan, you said something interesting. You said the big brands want the new, the you know, the new look, that sort of thing. How does somebody yeah. who's been, what have you been in the industry maybe 15 years or so, roughly? Just about, yeah. How yeah. does somebody who's been in for 15 years, and I'm, I don't mean to offend you, but you're not the new kid right now, right? You, right. how do you try to keep up with the new kids that are that are out there and getting into it? You know, because if if they've got the cool look that that these big brands are looking for. Um, you know, how do you, how do you compete with that? I think, I think the easiest way to, to quote unquote, like compete with it is just being able to provide clients with continuity amongst your style. Um, yes, everyone wants the new whatever, but there's a risk in taking that new whatever at the same time. So, you know, there, yes, some of the, I don't like to say lower tier commercial brands will work with the newest ones, but like you're going to always have the standard that you have to kind of live up to. And there's definitely a tier of like, we want the people who are tried and true, who know this industry, who know they can show it. Even if we're not there as a client, we know that the photo is going to get done the right way. And so you kind of level up throughout your career a little bit and you start to work with clients who just, all they want is that peace of mind that they know they're going to get good work out of you as opposed to here's the hot new thing. Like, I think we all can remember, I think it was five or seven years ago, how everything was getting shot with an iPhone for a little while. Like magazine covers were getting shot with iPhones. Movies were being filmed on iPhone. It was such a huge thing. But there is that there's a huge risk involved with doing stuff like that. 
So it gets its moment and then it kind of reverts back to where it was. And that's, that's, that's one of the ebbs and flows of this industry is the new kid will get his chance. And if he lives up to it, then he'll, he'll eventually level up to that status of, we know he's going to do good work no matter what. It just takes a little bit while, to, a little while to get to that level. And especially nowadays with like, everything is so instant, social media, you know, everything is fast, 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 now, 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 new, 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 new. Um, so it's probably a little trickier nowadays to get to that that next tier because everything is changing so, so quick. Uh, I think I got into photography literally at the, the right time, like the perfect time to get in is when I think I got into this industry because, you know, when I started, there was no Instagram, there was barely Facebook kind of things. And I got a, I got a good name in the industry, not by the number of likes I was getting or the comments I was getting. I got real industry professionals who were backing me up as opposed to like, Hey, look at all the likes I got. So I got in at the right time. Um, I think, and it's, as I said, it's gotta be kind of hard now. Well, and you got in, you got in with digital too, right? So you didn't have to have that, that learning curve from film to digital, or is this going to stick or any of that question? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think you could argue that you got in at a great time. Now, I, I also think it's funny, you know, you bring up the iPhone uh, shooters. I've heard some horror stories with that, you know, that people oh, would yeah, send, you know, these Instagram, like influencers basically out with an iPhone and they would come back with these shit images and then they'd have to have them, you know, photoshopped and manipulated and, you know, the money they spent ended up being like three times what they would have if they would have just hired, hired a photographer, a real photographer yeah. with it's a not real worth camera. the buzz at that point. <laughs> yeah, like so. you, you you lose the buzz, you lose the oh, we use an iPhone, well, that's great. But you also had a a crew of fifteen on set with reflectors and lights. You also had a lens on the front of that thing. Right. It was just there's I just don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. Doesn't make sense. It. Well, cool. So let's talk about. Uh, Maybe something that you wish you would have learned earlier on, you know, uh, in your career, what's something that if you were starting over right now, or if you had to talk to somebody who was just starting photography, what's a tip that you would give them just to kind of help them, you know, put their career in a good, good place uh, or or start off on a good foot? Uh, For a long time in my career, I wasn't really putting contracts in place. Um, outside of the big brands, but like someone locally wanted to hire me or whatever, or a band or something, I wouldn't put a contract in place because I didn't think I needed to. But those are the ones you specifically really need to because that'll bite you in the ass every single time. And I can't tell you how many times where I've had to, you know, just tell a client, like, screw it, here's your money back. I'm not dealing with this anymore. Like it does happen or it used to happen, you know, fair amount. Um, something else I would say is like, uh, I don't know, just that's the that's the biggest one. And I think other photographers who've been in this industry for a long enough time would tell you the same thing. It's just understanding where your photos are going to go and how they're used is huge. It's just so tell, it's tell us a story. Like, yeah, that's what, what I want to hear. Like, like any horror stories? Do you, have, do you have any horror stories? And you don't have to mention names of clients or anything, but, you know. I don't mind. One of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know, you know, uh, you know, it, 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 what is a usage right? You know, I think, and you kind of said that, you know, where you can use this image, how long you can use it for. Um, but what's appropriate? And what, or I guess what's normal for maybe most commercial clients and, yeah. um, or maybe at least with you. And then give us a horror story of, of like you know, when you didn't get a contract. When you wish you would have had something, something maybe you missed. I'll give, bigger. Yeah. I'll give, I'll give a, it'll, it'll be a little bit different. Uh, thing, but it'll, it'll make a lot of sense. So usage rights are just how long the photo can be used and in what type of, what form of media it's being used, whether that be in print or store or television, wherever the photo is going to go, that's going to be a part of those usage rights. And typically that falls under, uh, you know, it, usually two years is pretty much standard on the commercial world. So what happens is after those two years, you decide what's going to happen next. Are they going to continue to use the photos? And if so, they're going to pay you a licensing rate. And if they're not going to pay that, pay that rate, then those photos then come down and they're not used uh, anymore. So licensing and usage rights kind of go hand in hand a little bit. Uh, what I think a lot of photographers don't realize, especially new ones starting out, is a client is never, ever giving you money for pictures. And that sounds weird, 
but they're not paying you for photos. They're paying you to show up and take photos, but they're not paying you for these pictures you're taking. That comes under a licensing fee, a licensing rate that happens later. Now you can sell the rights to your work. Uh, in my entire career, I don't think anyone's ever bought the rights because it's very expensive to buy the rights to things because then you essentially become a, a non-creator of that work. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it can happen, sure. But I think, you know, if I think back to a time where, like, I think as photographers, we also forget that we are the ones who create the work, so we own it. Until we tell someone else they own it, we own it. And in my career, I there was a time where I used to co-run an ad agency for a few years, I think three or four years, um, as one of the the head creative directors for the for the company. And it was going great. I was shooting a lot of cool work for them. We had just wrapped up a commercial with BMW, and it was never like it was never a, a, a company thing where it was like these photos are property of the company. Like it was always kind of like, okay, Jonathan took them. Those are his work, whatever. Uh, I tried to leave that agency and then they in turn took all my hard drives and format, took all of, uh, the work off the hard drive and then formatted them. So I couldn't have access to the work that I shot. And I was like, uh, this isn't right. Like, that's not okay. And like, no, no, the rights are ours. We own the rights. So I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. So I had to go to court and it was a big messy thing. And I eventually ended up getting all my stuff back. And it was beautiful footage I shot for BMW, like some car driving stuff through um, through Colorado and just some wonderful footage. That, you know, that just goes to show, like, you need to understand that you control and you own this work that you're creating unless you express it completely otherwise. It's always going to be yours no matter what. And uh, there's other times when, when clients have told me one thing where the photo was going to go like, oh, it's just for social. And then I'll be in their store and I'll see it printed, you know, huge in the store. I'm like, well, that's not the thing that we discussed. You know, this is going to generate a different amount of revenue for you guys that I'm not being compensated for. And it's kind of, and it sounds, it makes me sound like a jerk a little bit. It makes photographers sound like jerks, but we're not. We just want to be fairly compensated for the work that we, you know, we did for you. Uh, so, yeah, I could probably name names of clients and maybe I shouldn't. That's probably not the best idea. Uh, but it does happen. And I, and I don't know if it's an intentional thing. I don't know if it's an, if it's. You know, it's our job as as the creators to sometimes educate the client on what these terms mean. Because I think, especially if you're being hired by a lower or smaller brand or a smaller company or even an individual, they don't understand that you're not being hired to give them photos. You're just being hired to show up and take these pictures. And then it's, that's another transaction that happens after that. So maybe it's on us to educate people about that more. Um, I think it I, is. I know that. Yeah, I think I think it is, I think it is. our it's our responsibility because at the top tier, you know, that's not even a discussion. Like that's your the client will send you the email saying this is what we need, this is our this is our usage rights, this is our licensing rate, blah blah blah. Do you want the job or not? So I think it's just a smaller tiered uh, thing that people just don't think about. And I didn't think about it for a long time in my career. I didn't think about licensing or, or usage. I was like, oh, you know, you hired me for a shoot. Here's your photos. Blah blah blah. Um, but since then, you know, I have an agent now and I've seen like kind of how it goes and it's, it's a whole other world. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's just a different, just a different thing. Well, I think it, it, that brings up a broader discussion of just like the value of, of photography as a profession. Right. And, and totally. I think, I think you as a commercial photographer, I think you, you're working with, you know, uh, these bigger brands who clearly they're using this stuff for marketing and, you know, they've got these massive budgets and that sort of thing. Um, but, but I'm sure a lot of people listening or watching are saying, well, I, I'm a family photographer. I like to do family photography on the weekend. And, uh, you know, sometimes my clients will get me like a $50 Amazon gift card in exchange for taking their family portrait. And it's like, yeah, but 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 let's put it in their position. You know, maybe they are a uh, uh, an eye doctor, <laughs> right? And There's does, lots it, of those. does the you. eye doctor let you come in and just say, you know what, I'm going to give you a fifty dollar Amazon gift card, and in exchange, you're going to give me my uh, appointment, you know, my eye test. And then also I really like those Ray Bans over there with that prescription. Like I, that's fair, right? Let's just do a trade. And uh, like, it's so interesting how people think like photographers are just like, 
you know, out here having fun and they they can't use a $50 Amazon gift card to pay their water bill or, you know, their electric bill or put food on their table. Like it's and that's what I think, you know, when you talk about educating, you know, just educating, you know, about photographers and like, you know, working photographers, like we have real bills to pay and we have real like, you know, a $50 Amazon gift card or, uh, you know, uh, you know, a hug and a kiss is not going to pay for, for these things that we need in life. So I think it's interesting. Like you're in a very unique position, but I think a lot of people who are doing like, Hey, will you shoot a wedding and I'll feed you at the end of it? It's like, uh, I can go to Taco Bell. I can go to Taco (laughs) Bell, scrap up some coins in my couch cushions and save myself eight hours of sweating at your wedding. That sounds more fun to me. Yeah, totally does. So, I think it's important. Like, I, I hope people listening really kind of stick up for yourself. Like, even the weekend warriors and the people who are hobbyists or you're just getting into photography. Like, there's so many people out there who are just getting into photography. Stick up for yourself. Stick up for the profession because yeah. this you are busting your ass out there and you are working hard. So you deserve to get, you know, uh, actual dollars, you know, not not pennies, dollars, and, and hopefully in the form of a check and uh you know, hopefully it clears and, and, you know, you can feed your family next week. So I think that's important uh, to talk. about. I think, I think also going back to pricing and stuff like, and I see this far too often and we all know it, like the people who will do so much work for such little money, it kind of hurts it for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I think if you're a new photographer or if you've been in the industry for a little while, find out the prices in that area and keep your prices very competitive, those numbers. So everyone can then charge that same rate. Mm-hmm. You know, the photographer is going to charge $75 for a four hour portrait session is only hurting everyone else mm-hmm. and themselves. Like we have to keep our, there's a level that we need to, we need to keep ourselves at and it's our responsibility to do so. Um, but I get it. Like a lot of people will charge little. I did it. $30 yeah, for an eight, eight hour it. birthday party. Do you think that would like affect the competitiveness though? I mean, do you, would you lose sort of your professionalism being at, you know, as far as you are, if somebody starting off is charging what you charge? No, because you shouldn't be getting hired for the amount of money you're charging anyways. So if someone wants to hire some dude down the street, who's been shooting for a year, and his work looks like garbage and that's, that's on them. Good for it. Go for it. Uh, I want to be hired because my work is good, mm-hmm. not because I'm the cheapest in town or whatever. So I don't think it diminishes my professionalism at all. I think if anything, it'll accentuate even more showing, well, I could have paid $1,500 with Jonathan or $1,500 with this other guy. That guy's work looks like garbage. So that must be the rate. So I'll just get the one who's better at this. Mm-hmm. And that what kind of, that's what I think will, will lead to a more uh, just established career for everyone. We all will make more money if we're all charging a similar number and we're getting hired for the amount for the style of work that we do, as opposed to, well, I need to save 500 bucks. So I'll go with this guy this time. Mm-hmm. Cause that automatically then sets that, whatever that shoot is at that rate for everybody else. Mm-hmm. So it just, it will slowly just, you know, race to the bottom. Become, yeah. It's a race to the bottom. At mm-hmm. that point. Absolutely. Yeah. I like that outlook. All right. Well, cool. Well, let's do some quick fire questions just because, uh, you know, we're, we're wrapping up here. Sure. What, and I know the answer to this. <laughs> why are you so obsessed <laughs> with Whataburger? And you I don't know. even know if I'm saying it right. Do I need to say it with a southern draw? Do I need to say it quicker? Whataburger? Oh, I'd, I'd love to hear you try to say it with a southern draw. Though. So <laughs> by all means, go ahead and fire that out. Let's head on down to the Whataburger. We get <laughs> <laughs> them new. Them new jalapeno, uh, jalapeno burgers. Jalapeno burgers. They're on special. You know, there's, there's just something good about that Whataburger. I'll tell you. Um, why am I obsessed with Whataburger? So I went to. I was in. <laughs> I was in Houston for a photo shoot years ago, and I was starving. It was late at night, and I looked down the street. I never heard of Whataburger before. And I walked across the highway to get there. It was it was very late. I may have had a couple drinks. And I needed to go get some meat. And I got a triple cheeseburger, which is just way too much for anyone to eat. And it just blew my mind. Like, it was something about it. So I just became obsessed. I learned about the brand. And I learned that you can get, like, Whataburger shirts. I have Whataburger Christmas tree ornaments on my Christmas nice, tree. Nice, nice. And there's not a Whataburger 
like anywhere near where I live. Yeah. The closest one's in Alabama, okay. which I've definitely flown to for lunch just to have a burger <laughs> and flown back home. Uh, but I have Whataburger shirts, they have shoes, they have all this stuff. And I just, it's just good. It's just yeah. good garbage food. And I really enjoy it a lot. They got good mustard. They got a good mustard. I appreciate that. Uh, that, that. <laughs> I, and the reason I found that, Jonathan was doing an event for us at uh, Precision Camera. And I think... <laughs> I think in the itinerary he had planned out. It was a weekend event, and I think he planned out three trips <laughs> yeah, in that I one weekend. If I'm in Texas, I don't eat anything else. It like, is I'll good, have three but meals a day. That's... Every day I'm there, just water burger. Keeps the expense it's, reports, it's... Uh, you know, nice and low. Nice and low. Yeah. yeah, we we appreciate. It's like that. it's like seventeen dollars <laughs> for me to eat anywhere. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, Favorite favorite meal now at Whataburger? Is it still the triple cheeseburger, or have you moved on? <laughs> or so you can hack it and you get the. <laughs> I hate that we're talking about this. this I love cool. that we're t- and <laughs> I think the Texas people listening are probably like, why are they so obsessed? I drive past three of those on the way to work. Oh, they don't know how lucky they are. You get the. You get the um, the chicken, the barbecue chicken strip sandwich, but sub beef with Monterey Jack cheese. It'll blow your brains out. It's so good. So good. Wow, you've got the hack. <laughs> All right. Most stressed you've ever been on a job, Jonathan? Oh, man. I shot a wedding long time ago. Long time ago. Uh, I had one lens, a 50 millimeter lens. I had one memory card that was four gigs on an original 5D. And I remember dumping the memory card in the back of the church because it filled up before like we even got to like the vows. And I was freaking out the whole time. I missed the kiss. I <laughs> ruined that whole wedding. And I remember during the reception, I went up to the bridal, the uh, the bride and groom was like, listen, guys, I have screwed this up terribly for y'all. And they were cool. They're like, it's okay, man. Don't worry about it. I'm like, no, you should really care a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> about what I've not done for you. And you have given me money, and I'm giving you this money back because I did a terrible job. I'm going to stick around, but just know you should probably get married again and you'll get a better outcome than what I provided for you. That was definitely one. I've had shoots where I've broken my camera, like just shattered it. It's dropped from like 15 feet off of a roof before. Um, I've had lights blow up on set. Not Westcott's. Um, I've had... I've had a lot of bad stuff. I've had my car, my, my camera bag get run over on a shoot. Like it was wow. sitting in a car backed up over it and just everything inside was destroyed. Oh, geez. Um, anything bad that could ever happen, I think I've experienced on a shoot. So the, there's the, the wedding thing, super stressful because I, it's a wedding. Um, I've had stressful client. I've had stressful shoots because of the client. I used to do these overnight shoots for this fashion brand where we would shoot. We'd start the shoot at midnight and go till 7 a.m. because that's just how it worked out. And that was the one time in my career I actually walked off on a set because the client was just being just awful. Just awful, awful, awful. And I just turned around and left. I said, I'm sorry, I can't I can't help you out with this anymore. Hmm. It's like four in the morning and I'm just pissed. Yeah. So, yeah. If I'm gonna be here at four AM, I better be happy and uh, I better have Whataburger. Yeah. Have, have a triple cheeseburger. So is that is Whataburger your favorite place you visited or <laughs> do you have a good do you have a good place that you travel to? USA. <laughs> USA. Um, last question. Best client you've worked for? You, you've got a lot of big, uh, big brands that you've worked for. Has there been one that kind of stood out as the best? Yeah, I've done. I've done a lot of work with uh, Lululemon. Uh, they're they're an awesome brand to work with. I'd say I've been shooting their stuff for going on six or seven years. Um, I do a lot of their store level work, and that's been that's been great. Uh, I work with Apple on a fair amount of projects. I'm actually shooting something for them tonight after we're done with this. Um, Apple's been really, really awesome to work with. They're very easy to work with. It's 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 continuous shoot. We do a, we do a uh, shoot either every month or every other month, depending on what their needs are for for that month's uh, marketing uh, plan. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Uh, some of the some of the alcohol brands I've worked with over the years have been really great to work with. They've been a lot of fun. Um, post cereals. I've done some really cool stuff with them over the years. They've all been pretty cool. Um, I've, had, I've been fortunate enough to work with some celebrities and some some pretty high, uh, well known musicians as well. And they've all been great. I've been I've been pretty fortunate. There's and honestly the the quote unquote bad clients are the ones that are like 
what I talked about earlier, like the lower tier, like you know it's going to be kind of a bad situation, already kind of going into it, but you're hoping it's not. But when you get to that 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 bigger tier of stuff, it's it's usually a pretty enjoyable experience. All right, Jonathan, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe below or subscribe on whatever channel you're listening to us on. And we made it. The end of season one. Uh, we will be filming some new episodes for season two starting in the fall. And so we look forward to joining you again for season two here on Photo Pros Weekly. Thanks so much for watching and listening. See you next time.